Hello, my name is John Antonakis. I'm Professor of Organizational Behavior at the University of Lausanne. Today, I'm going to talk about a topic that many researchers don't know about or care to avoid, endogeneity. Experimental methods are one way to deal with endogeneity. There are other ways, a bit more complex, that borrow a lot from econometrics. I would like to depict the relationship between X and Y using Ballantyne's. This example is taken from Kennedy's Introduction to Econometrics book. Imagine here we have the two variables, Y and X. And the overlap that they have, where it intersects, is actually the percentage of, say, overlap or variance that is shared between the two variables. And that is actually what we want to estimate when we estimate an ANOVA model or a regression model. Assume that is the slope, beta. Of course, Y depends on X, but Y depends on other variables that we have not measured. I'm just going to add one in here, M. Now, because we have exogenously manipulated X, X does not overlap with M at all. It is independent of it, or it is orthogonal to it. Therefore, what we estimate in terms of X predicting in Y, the slope coefficient, is actually consistent. By consistent, we mean that it reflects the true value as the sample size will increase. But even with experiments, we can have endogeneity problems. Unbeknown to some experimentalists, I've noticed this very often in psychology, sometimes we actually might measure two dependent variables in an experiment, Y1 and Y2, and we want to estimate the causal effect of Y1 on Y2 as a function of X. So for example, subjects were randomly assigned to treatment, we call this X, and they were then measured on Y1 and Y2. Now, suppose that Y1 and Y2 share a common cause, which is possible because they were measured at relatively the same time. Suppose they were exposed, the participants, to a certain leader, and perhaps they liked the leader or not because of what the leader looked like. That's got nothing to do with the treatment that was administered. Therefore, if one tries to estimate the causal effect of Y1 on Y2, there is an endogeneity problem again between Y1 and Y2. And this endogeneity problem needs to be acknowledged. By acknowledged, we mean that the causal structure of the data must be modeled correctly. That is, X causes Y1 and Y2, but there is a common cause linking Y1 to Y2 that must be modeled. This correlation between the two disturbances must actually be modeled in the estimation procedure. Very often, they do not do that. And if it is not done, the correlation then that is estimated between Y1 and Y2 will actually be misestimated. It will be wrong. The solution to this problem is very simple. It is to use the two-stage least squares estimator, 2SLS. In this case, X is known as the exogenous variable or the instrument which is used to help identify the causal effect of Y1 or Y2. How are we going to do this? We will find the portion of variability that X and Y1 share that overlaps with Y2. However, we must model this causal structure correctly by correlating the cross-equation disturbances. Going back to our Ballantines, so you can understand the nature of the problem, suppose we wish to estimate the relationship between Y1 and Y2, the causal relationship that is. Unfortunately, Y1 and Y2 share a common cause, which is Q. As you can see, the portion where Q overlaps with Y1 and Y2 is what is going to cause the endogeneity problem. This must be correctly acknowledged in the estimator. Now, if we just estimate this relationship between Y1 and Y2, as you will see, the overlapping area consists of a true component, but it also consists of an error component, and that is where the three circles overlap. That portion of the variance in the yellow circle is going to be incorrectly estimated if we use what's called the normal 
OLS or Ordinary Least Squares Estimator or maybe even Maximum Likelihood. It doesn't matter which estimator we use, but if we don't acknowledge the correct causal structure and find an instrument that is exogenous to the system of variables, we cannot identify the causal effect of Y1 on Y2. The instrument in this case is X. As you can see, X overlaps both with Y1 and Y2. Because X is exogenous, it does not overlap at all with the omitted common cause Q or any other causes, and I have not put them all in the model. We are just isolating Q just to demonstrate the point. So what the estimator is going to do is it's going to look at the share of overlapping variance that X has with Y1 and Y2 to estimate the relationship of Y1 with Y2. Even though it's only using a smaller portion over the, of the overlap of Y1 with Y2, it will still estimate it consistently. In other words, what coefficient we will find will be correctly estimated even though we use less information. This portion of the variance is what I call in the picture Y1 hat. Y1 hat is the predicted value of Y1 that is due to X. Now this predicted value has a very special property. It does not overlap with Q at all, as you can see in the diagram. This is the actual two-stage least squares estimate, which can be estimated using two-stage least squares or maximum likelihood. I will show you in a minute how. What's important to do is to correlate the two disturbances, the disturbances of Y1 and Y2. That is, you have to acknowledge in this estimator that Y1 and Y2 are endogenous and that they potentially share a common cause. The correlation between these two disturbances, as I indicate in the Ballantines, is actually what the Haussmann test estimates. So let me show you how to estimate this correctly. But first we will start off how to estimate it incorrectly. Now usually what is done in these cases is that Y1 is used as a predictor of Y2. The problem is that Y1 actually correlates with the disturbance in Y2. In other words, this correlation is not zero. Beta1, the relationship between Y1 and Y2, will in fact be inconsistent in its estimation. It won't be correct. Now the correct way to estimate this model is to actually use the instruments to predict Y1 first and then to use the predicted value of Y1 to predict Y2. To do that we must correlate the disturbances of the two equations. In other words the disturbances of Y1 and Y2. So this disturbance correlation I call Psi1. Now if this correlation Psi1 is not zero and it is estimated, we will kill endogeneity. If Psi1 is not zero and we don't estimate it, we're going to have a big problem. And this big problem is just like we did before. If I can go back to the previous figure, it's as if we never used the instruments to predict Y1 and use the predicted value of Y1 to predict Y2. In other words, constraining that covariance between the two disturbances to zero is going to give exactly the same and inconsistent wrong estimate as if we never had Z or Q in the model. And this is how many researchers go about testing such causal models. They have two endogenous variables, they may have exogenous variables from an experiment ideally, but they don't use them in the correct way to estimate the relationship between Y1 and Y2. If the two variables that are endogenous share a common cause, this must be acknowledged in the estimator. Let me demonstrate to you a specific case with simulated data. This data is available on my website and I encourage you to download it and play around with it in different programs to see whether you can obtain the same estimates that I do. So, Suppose the model that generated the data, in fact the true model underlying the relationships between the two variables is depicted as such. We have X that causes Y, but we have Q that causes both X and Y. We also have two instruments, M and N, that are exogenous. They don't correlate with U, with E, and indeed with Q. So what we're trying to estimate is the causal effect of X on Y. 
and this causal effect is supposed to be minus 0.30. So, we can estimate this model correctly, even if we don't include Q in the model, as long as we correlate the two cross-equation disturbances. As you can see from the simulated data, and here the data are quite large, I have a sample size of 10,000 observations, we see that this two-stage least squares estimator recovers the true parameter almost precisely. It estimates it to be minus 0.29. Remember, the true estimate was minus 30. Now, if this is estimated the usual way, the OLS way, where this correlation is not acknowledged, it's as if we were doing two separate OLS equations. So even though you estimate the system of equations simultaneously, and if you do not correlate the cross-equation disturbances, it's as if you had estimated two separate equations that links them with nothing at all. In this case, when we regress y on x, we obtain an estimate of 0 0.03. Remember, the true estimate was minus 0.30. So we are way off in what we have estimated. Try this yourselves. Simply take y and regress it on x, you will get an estimate of 0 0.03. That's the observed correlation. This is completely wrong. So you may use all the fancy big hammers and structural equation modeling programs. But if the model, firstly, does not have exogenous variables to identify the effect of x on y, you cannot get the correct estimates. Second problem is, if you don't acknowledge the endogeneity between the two endogenous variables, you're not going to get correct estimates. Now, here's the million Swiss franc question. And for viewers in the United States, be assured this is a lot of money. It's actually 1.2 million bucks. Where do we get instruments from? In experimental design, it's very easy to get an instrument. That's the variable that was exogenously manipulated, or variables. And ideally, you will have more variables than you have endogenous regresses, so that you can estimate what's called an over-identification statistic, whether the structure that you have in the data, the causal structure, is actually valid. Um, so what that does, in, in fact, it compares the model that you have with what it observes in the data, just like as if you are comparing an architectural plan of a house uh, versus what was actually built to see how close it was. So the closer the model is to the data, the more likely the model generated the data. So it is good to have instruments, uh, to have at least uh, uh, a couple more than what, uh, what we have in terms of endogenous regresses. Where do we get instruments if we haven't done an experiment? There are many creative ways that you can go about getting uh, instruments. Economists have identified many, many interesting ways to do it when you want to, for example, estimate the effect of firms on performance or country-level uh, variables on, on country-level performance or on firms. There can be geographic instruments, there can be distance instruments, there can be vectors of malaria, many, many different ways. In psychology, for example, one can use uh, an I the IQ of a leader or any kind of fixed or constant effect that is genetically determined. So we talk about this in the paper um, in, published in the Leadership Quarterly and the title is on making causal claims. So if you're interested to find out more about it, please refer to the paper. To summarize, if x is not exogenous, its relation to y is suspect. And it has to be corrected using some kind of corrective technique which will kill endogeneity. There are many, many cases of this in the literature. And the paper to which I referred to, published in the Leadership Quarterly, we found that even in very, very good journals, in top journals in management and applied psychology, that estimates were severely compromised by using incorrect modeling procedures. So, recall, we cannot regress Y, satisfaction of followers or what have you, on LMX, leader member exchange. LMX is endogenous. We cannot use a uh, hierarchical linear modeling estimator, which looks at random effects when level one variables could correlate with the fixed effects. The fixed effects are an omitted cause. We cannot regress uh, company performance on an endogenous choice for example, using a certain controlled strategy or not using it, because the choice is endogenous. It has to be modeled correctly. And that's exactly where James Heckman, in fact, won the Nobel Prize in, in 2000. 
the procedure that's named for him, the Heckman two-step, he found out a way in which he could correct for this endogeneity and reproduce a true counterfactual, just like in an experimental design. Thank you for taking the time to listen to this University of Lausanne podcast. If you are interested to find out more information about endogeneity and how to correct for it, please refer to the following paper. The paper is available on my website or if you wish you may email me and I'll be very glad to give it to you. Before closing, make sure to think about the supposed causal effect that someone is trying to convince you of. Was the claim made in the context of an experimental design? If not, is it possible that there are omitted causes that haven't been correctly modelled? Were instruments used to assure that the causal direction of the effect of an endogenous regression can be identified on a dependent variable? If there's any cause for doubt, don't trust the results of the study that has published them. Remember, endogeneity is like a disease. It must be stomped out in every one of its forms. It's not ethical, neither economical, to base policies or practices on procedures that might not work. Thank you for listening to this podcast.